Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Anna Voising, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar. Uh, we will be discussing the judgment of the Court of Justice of the European Union on the Muzzle Law and Disciplinary System for Judges in Poland that was presented to us yesterday. And uh, I'm delighted to have you all here with us. Thank you for joining, for taking time to be part of this event. And it's an important note that the event is supported by the Active Citizens National Programme, which is one of the 11 programmes implemented in Poland with funding from the European Economic Area Financial Mechanism and the Norwegian Financial Mechanism, known as the Norwegian and EEA grants for the period 2014-2021. So the aim of the fund is to strengthen civil society, promote civic engagement and empower marginalized groups at risk of exclusion. And we will empower ourselves today with knowledge about EU law. And this knowledge will be presented by great specialists in um, judicial independence, the EU law, uh, the European law. And I will have a great pleasure to introduce uh, our speakers. Uh, professor Laurent Pesch, who is full professor of law, dean of law and head of the Sutherland School of Law, a leading legal expert in the field of the rule of law. And he is also a visiting professor of law at uh, Bordeaux University, a senior research fellow at the CEU Democracy Institute in Budapest, and the co-director of the Good Lobby Profs. Welcome, Laurent. We also have with us Monika Fronskowiak, who is a judge of the District Court in Poznań, Poland, and Vice President of MEDEL, Magistrat Européen pour la Démocratie et la Liberté, one of the most important European associations of judges. She is also a member of the Polish Judges Association, Justitia. Welcome, Monika. And we have also Patrick Wachowicz, who is a legal analyst at the Civil Development Forum and the co-founder of Kader Institute. He was a fellow at the Bingham Center for the Rule of Law, and he is a co-founder and co-editor of the English language website, The Rule of Law in Poland. So it's a pleasure to actually uh, not only co-edit this, um, this project with Patrick, but also have a, a panel with him. And um, we are now, um, I think, already um, full. Uh, I'm looking at the audience list, so, so let's start. Um, so um, the question would be to Laurent. Uh, the format is that we have a free series of questions and then we'll have a QA. and a and uh, you are more than welcome to the audience to ask questions. Uh, so the first question to Laurent. So basically it's a basic question. So what did the recent judgment of the EU Court of Justice concerning Poland's muzzle law and disciplinary system for judges actually state about the limitations on what governments in the EU can do in relation to judges. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure being with you. And uh, it's not easy to uh, quickly uh, summarize uh, the rule of law, case law of the Court of Justice, or even uh, let alone uh, this judgment regarding the Muzzle Law. It took me about uh, six, seven hours, I think, to read uh, the judgment in its entirety. Um, I didn't read the Polish version. Uh, I limited myself to reading the French version, so uh, but seven hours even in my own mother tongue. So not easy to summarize uh, uh, the judgment or the case law, but I'm going to attempt to give you a, a quick overview. Essentially, every key provision of uh, the piece of legislation known as the Mos Mos Law, so one of the many pieces of legislation adopted by current authorities, all the key components of this muzzle law have been found to violate multiple provisions of EU law and not simply uh, um, rule of law related provisions, but also a preliminary ruling mechanism, for instance, or data protection and privacy uh, rules uh, under the charter. All of them have been found to, to be, have been violated by Poland's muzzle law. So essentially, the Muzzle Law is as good as dead from an EU law point of view. There's nothing left uh, following the judgment, which is compatible essentially with EU law. You could argue, in fact, uh, that the Muzzle Law was already uh, fully uh, in violation of Poland's constitution and cannot, will not survive any application before the Strasbourg Court. So the Muzzle Law is as good as dead from a, a European law point of view. This comes on top of a previous judgment of the Court of Justice regarding the new disciplinary regime for judges. Again, all of the provisions, uh, all the major changes made by the 
ruling party or the current authorities were found to be incompatible with multiple provisions of EU law. So essentially, at the, at the end of the day, uh, the Court of Justice explained at the start of the judgment what membership of EU law requires. And it's actually not that complicated. Uh, the EU uh, Court of Justice is only asking uh, Poland to, first of all, comply with basic membership requirements, including the principle of effective judicial protection, which includes the right to a fair trial, the right to access independent courts, and uh, also the right for national Polish judges. I mean, it's not even a right, it's an obligation for Polish judges to apply judgments of the Court of Justice and to apply EU law. So essentially, the Court of Justice is sending the message, stop uh, bullying Polish judges, stop punishing them for doing, in fact, their work. The rule of law is a basic membership requirement of EU law, uh, and this is, in fact, an undertaking uh, Polish authorities uh, accepted when joining uh, the EU. Uh, in fact, there is an interesting aspect of the judgment uh, at the first few pages uh, uh, of the court's findings. It reads like a, a first-year law lecture, you know, for students uh, who have never done EU law, they don't know what EU law means. You read the judgment, it's frankly embarrassing, I would say, if I were the receiving government, because the court is forced to repeat basic legal principles, which are actually basic legal principles of Polish constitutional law. So at the end of the day, and just to quickly summarize, uh, the Polish government is again asked to comply with basic membership requirements and basic legal principles, which are also uh, part of the Polish uh, legal order. Uh, that being said, as we know, uh, Polish authorities have been violating uh, multiple domestic, but also European judgments. And I would not expect them to start complying anytime soon because essentially compliance with the judgment of the Court of Justice and previous judgments would mean that not a single one of their so-called judicial reforms uh, would be able to survive. There is no choice if they want to comply that they have to essentially undo everything they've done since uh, 2016. That's what uh, the judgment and other judgments of the Court of Human Rights and the Court of Justice require. Uh, but I guess we can discuss uh, compliance uh, uh, in uh, round two. Or maybe that's a difficult question that you're going to give to Patrick, perhaps. Uh, yes, perhaps uh, Patrick will have the most difficult question actually now, because um, we have uh, seen reactions uh, from the Polish government. I wouldn't say that they were unpredictable, um, but because they are quite consistent in denying um, certain elements of uh, ECG case law. Uh, but one um, important element is that uh, the government attempts to diminish the significance of that ruling uh, by stating that it concerns issues that no longer exist in Polish law. So actually, what uh, elements mentioned in this judgment are still valid in Poland, Patrick? Uh, well, thank you for having me. Uh, it's also a great, great pleasure to discuss the very important judgment not only to the Polish legal order but also to the European uh, legal sphere. Uh, well, uh, uh, having a look at what the Polish uh, authorities uh, have said after the, the, uh, this judgment, well, we can see that most of them were furious about what has uh, what the court has decided, but I think all of the participants can agree that this was a very predictable judgment. We already knew that uh, you know it is uh, it is an obligation on national courts to verify whether the courts of lower instance or or other judges are independent. We already knew that asking judges to disclose certain uh, information about their, their personal life can can uh, stigmatize them can threaten their their career or private life this was this was all obvious to me um, uh, in order to respond to your question i have gathered uh, a bunch of a bunch of responses from from the polish authorities uh, and I found four of them. The first, uh, the first was uh, of the Minister of Justice, uh, Zbigniew Ziobro, that has already started an investigation against judges of the of the Court of Justice of the European Union. Uh, I think in 2021, 
uh, which which concerns some some allegations that 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 there is a corruption within within European institutions, and according to according to Jobro, uh, the uh, the Court of Justice is a corrupted institution. Uh, its judgments are unreliable; they that cannot be legitimate. And until the European Commission clarifies uh, what uh, what is all about the uh, the alleged corruption scandal uh, that was described, for example, by by the weekly Liberation, uh, it is not difficult to regard the judgment uh, the judgment as a legitimate and ECJ as a as a genuine institution. Um, also, we have uh, a response from the State Prosecutor Office. Uh, which is the top uh, the top institution in the uh, hierarchy of of Polish uh, prosecution subordinated directly to the Ministry of Justice that said that uh, the judgment is uh, is incompatible with both the treaty on the European Union and Consti and uh, the constitution of the Republic of Poland it violates the uh, principle of conferral the principle of respect of uh, of constitutional uh, machinery of each member state, uh, so um, it is. You know, the, I'm I'm kind of fed up with with those with those uh, explanations because we can hear about that on and on since the first judgment in 2017. Correct me if I'm wrong, Laurent. Uh, that well well this is the overstepping of of the competence of of uh, of the court of justice uh, against the constitution and so on and so forth but if you take a look precisely at this judgment and uh, take a look at the references which the court of justice made you can clearly see that it uh, referenced the three important uh, set of judgment the first are the very fundamental uh, uh, rulings, uh, the founding rulings of, of EU law. I mean, Costa NL, Internationales Handelsgesellschaft, and so on and so forth. So concerning the primacy of EU law, even uh, even when it comes to the conflict with with national constitutions. The second is the landmark judgment in the case concerning uh, concerning um, uh, the conditionality regulation. So Poland and Hungary versus the Parliament and the Council, uh, which which confirmed that this is an obligation of the member state not, not only to comply with the rule of law when they uh, apply for uh, for the membership, but but also after after the uh, admission to the uh, EU law. And the third is the landmark judgment in the disciplinary uh, in in the case concerning the disciplinary regime for Polish judges. Uh, that has many, many, uh, you know, many, uh, many parallel parallels with with yesterday's judgment. So, to sum up, I think we see all the the, the very same tactics from the Polish government. You know, to muddy the waters, to uh, not to uh, to uh, not to explain in details what is what is happening, uh, giving uh, arguments that are not legitimate under Polish law, and so on and so forth. So. Well, it is our duty to explain in details what this ruling means to the society, to the judiciary, uh, other lawyers, and so on and so forth. Uh, so we might see the similar tactics after other judgments of the Court of Justice uh, will be issued. Thank you, Patrick. And now a question to Monica. Um, one of the elements of this judgment was um, finding by the EU Court of Justice that uh, Muslim law provisions infringe on privacy of Polish judges by requiring them to disclose information about their membership in associations, in foundations, and past membership in political parties. So could you explain why this is important, in particular in Poland, of course, today? Well, first of all, thank you for the inv invitation and uh, thank you to our speakers. Uh, first of all, if I may, I would only underline that uh, there are still some provisions in our uh, law on the system of the common courts, uh, which are still valid, and they are exactly from the Muslim law. And also last year, it was amended uh, another time, I don't even remember which time, 
and uh, it was so-called presidential uh, uh, legal act amendment and new provisions uh, appeared in this law saying that, for example, in case when you uh, refuse to deliver justice, that's it's, it's beautifully described, uh, you can, uh, uh, it is the, the disciplinary offense. So uh, the Mazel law is still valid and it's working. But uh, going to your question, uh, well, uh, answering very shortly, I would say that it is so important because this provision, um, which oblige, obliges judges to reveal uh, their membership is just simply another tool to harass judges. And uh, we saw it uh, immediately when the law was introduced. Uh, some judges refused to, uh, to deliver this, this statement and some disciplinary proceedings uh, were launched against them. To my, uh, I, I, I was surprised uh, that in, in case of me, for example, they didn't launch the disciplinary uh, proceedings on the basis of, of, of this, because I also denied to deliver the statement. It's really dependent, but so many judges refused to deliver this statement. Anyway, uh, what I found very interesting in the verdict of the, the, uh, of the tribunal in Luxembourg is that Okay, there are some situations when you can limit the principle of the uh, data protection, but you really need to have good reasons for this and the proportionality needs to be uh, kept in this case. And in case of this law, nothing like this uh, is happening. And uh, Polish government, it's not as far, I also read it a few hours in my own language, like Laurent Pesci in, in his own, and his very long verdict. As far as I have understood, it's not directly said that uh, it is in between lies that actually Polish government is not acting in good faith. Because uh, the argumentation for this was that we have to uh, guarantee for the parties that the court is not biased and, and the process is very transparent. So uh, the party needs to know whether uh, a, a judge, particular judge is a member of this or this foundation or uh, used to be a member of political party uh, because Polish government wants so much the independence of, of the courts, which is, such a big lie because in the same law they are doing so many things to diminish the uh, independence of justice so um it's uh, it's very clear intention and uh, this is also one of the arguments that you can find in this in this judgment so i think this is very important for us uh, for judges and uh, this is just one of the basic fundamental rights and I just give you one example. Uh, there was the that there is a judge. Uh, I don't remember from which city, but she is a member of a foundation, uh, which is aimed at helping uh, uh, children with very rare disease. So she refused to reveal the name of the foundation, and the disciplinary proceeding was launched against her. And uh, she didn't want to reveal it because uh, she didn't want uh, her child to, to be stigmatized. So, uh, so, so this is one, one of the example I can give you just now. Thank you, Monica. That's a very, very chilling example and very stark problem. And um, second round of questions starts and it will begin surprisingly not by Laurent, but by Patrick. And I will ask Patrick to kindly explain to us what uh, does the famous test of independence conducted by judges in Poland currently stand for? What's the problem with it? What's the government's problem with it? And which court can now do the test? Uh, well, this is a very important question. Let me uh, let me remind that the, the name uh, independence test, test of judicial independence, we translated in many in many ways. Uh, it is it is not a legal term. This is a term derived from 
a set of provisions introduced last year by the presidential amendment that was meant to unblock the EU recovery fund for Poland uh, and concerned uh, judicial milestones. Uh, well, initially, and this is the law that is in force uh, even today, uh, the independence the, the independence test was a was a kind of tool to in in a way to remedy the situation uh, to respond to allegations from both the Court of Justice and the European Commission about the lack of uh, you know mechan mechanism to to verify the independence of other courts and uh, until until now every party to the proceedings can ask uh, can ask a, a court for the test and uh, and the party can claim that uh, a judge is not independent um, because of uh, his or her conduct after the judicial nomination and it is ex uh, and it is uh, and it is ex uh, um, and it is prohibited by by the current legislation to raise uh, arguments concerning the nomination procedure. For example, the lack of independence of the National Council of the Judiciary, some uh, you know uh, some irregularities when it comes to the nomination procedure, uh, and the and the uh, act of the president that nominates judges. Uh, what is also important is that each party has only seven days to raise this claim uh, under Polish law, and it concerns every proceedings, civil, criminal, administrative, family, and so on and so forth. So this is a very short time limit uh, to, you know, to gather the evidence, even to ask the National Council of the Judiciary under Freedom of Information Act to disclose some details about the nominating procedure uh, to you know build up the argument and to and to send it to court and in my opinion and not only in my opinion but uh, according to many civil society organization and experts this is not uh, th this is an impractical procedure that cannot you know uh, that cannot that cannot cure the situation what is also important is that when you when you start the test for independence, uh, it it can be also uh, examined by judges nominated in the very same procedure that we are questioning, uh, and and it is very plausible that the that the so-called neo judges will will conduct those those tests. Uh, so the the this mechanism is broken according to many experts. And uh, you know it cannot be a genuine response to uh, to requirements of, of of EU law. What the president wanted to to change in this mechanism, these changes are very you know subtle. Let's let's call it this way, because the president uh, because the the president wanted uh, wanted to uh, you know to. Uh, allow not only parties to the proceedings but individual judges sitting on the bench to ask whether their colleagues are fine let's call it in that way uh, but also the seven day time limit has has been uh, uh, has been said uh, no possibility to verify the uh, the nominating procedure uh, and so on and so forth so this is, you know, this is a very good tactics by authoritarian regimes. I, I must, I must say to, to conclude my, my, my speech because, uh, you know, you try on one hand you try to convince the European Commission, you know, everything is fine. We have procedures, we have mechanisms, and so on and so forth. But on the other hand, you do not explain the details uh, about uh, about this about this mechanism. Um, uh, but, but but details matter, you know, uh, and um, if and even you know even legal experts they must they, they they must sit for for a couple of hours check 
whether this mechanism is in line with EU law. The conclusion is obvious, it is not, but it takes time. So this is this is the, the, the very same tactics as with, with many other uh, provisions introduced by, by the current government. You know, the muzzle law, the early retirement of judges, that, you know, they uh, everything everything for to increase the judicial independence, you know, the disclosure of, of personal data and so on and so forth. Uh, so, uh, in my opinion, this mechanism should be abolished. And fortunately, after this judgment, we will talk about this in the, in the next round. After this judgment, every single judge, not only in Poland, but within the European Union legal order, is empowered and it's confirmed that he or she can verify the status of other judges. This is a very powerful tool, but at the same time, judges must be very responsible in, 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 uh, in applying that, that mechanism. Uh, but to me, this is the, the most natural, genuine, uh, you know, uh, tool to check whether this, this court, the court of lower instance is, is, is valid, is lawful, the court of the constitutional court is okay, and so on and so forth. Thank you very much, Patrick. That was a little spoilery but uh, we'll return to it in the third round as well. And Monica, could you explain um, actually who was um, harassed under the provision that prohibits um, conducting such tests in Poland? Is it really problematic for, for from the standpoint of judges in Poland? Yeah, uh, apart from Igor Tulaya, all other judges who were suspended, they were suspended on the basis of conducting this test and uh, uh, are undermining uh, the uh, constitutional institutions like Judicial Council in Poland and so on. So uh, what is very important is, it, it, I need to underline it, uh, because of this recovery plan and uh, money which Poland desperately needs, uh, the Polish authorities decided to reinstate the suspended judges, but the disciplinary proceedings are still con continuing, they are pending, and what's more, new investigations were launched even this year, uh, so against, for example, Paweł Juszczyszyn um, uh, and some other judges from Krakow, for example, uh, so uh, our disciplinary officers are still very active they, and they continuously uh, launch uh, disciplinary proceedings against judges on the basis of, uh, of this muzzle law provisions, actually. That's, uh, that's some judges try to verify whether other judges are real judges or not. And uh, disciplinary proceeding is not uh, the only result, but even in the past, some the criminal proceedings were uh, launched against some, some particular judges. And in case, for example, of Piotr Goncharek, he was transferred to another department in his court uh, only because uh, uh, he questioned the the uh, legality of some some judges and the uh, uh, process of the appointments, and the same situation happened to uh, three judges in in court of appeal in in Warsaw, uh, who were transferred to also another department, uh, uh, and uh, I need to say because it's really outrageous and people seem to be quite used to this situation now, unfortunately. Uh, in case of uh, Eva furta Gleszczyńska, Marzanna Dążyk, and uh, I forgot the, the surname of the third uh, judge, Eva Gregaitis, sorry. Uh, even the interim measure was delivered by the European Court of Human Rights and, <laughs> and uh, it didn't change anything. So. Uh, the authorities, uh, the, the president of the Court of Appeal didn't apply this uh, decision. So it is still going on and not mentioning the propaganda against these judges in, in uh, public media. So uh, it's still continuing and uh, we will see what's going to happen now, but I hope, I am afraid that still we still have this disciplinary officers and the whole machinery we still have, nothing is going to change for now. 
that's a very bleak prediction. Uh, Laurent, we know that in the yesterday's judgment, there was um, that there was a, a new standard um, established uh, on um, actually the test of independence, the possibility to to uh, verify whether a court is correctly established under the EU law. Could you explain it a little bit to us? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's not very easy to explain quickly. Just uh, before I attempt to do so, just a quick reaction to uh, Monica's uh, comments regarding, for instance, forced transfers of judges. It's uh, unlawful uh, as a matter of EU law and ECHR law. So it's quite clear. Uh, Polish authorities are violating uh, EU law and ECHR law in this respect. Generally speaking, I think it's important perhaps to make the point that every disciplinary measure or disciplinary sanction adopted by on the basis of a provision which was found to be incompatible with EU law or uh, judgments or entry measures uh, of uh, ECHR of the European Court of Human Rights, I would say, uh, then that should bring uh, in play uh, into play the criminal liability of the disciplinary officers. When the rule of law is restored, I would say that everyone involved in essentially what amounts to the harassment of any Polish judge is committing potentially a criminal offense as a matter of Polish law. We should expose them to a criminal prosecution uh, when the rule of law is restored. So I think it's important that people who are engaging in the unlawful harassment, bullying, and sanctioning of judges and prosecutors actually, uh, should realize that they are essentially uh, engaging their criminal liability uh, in due course. Uh, this uh, being said, let me go back to this uh, independence test. Uh, as a matter of EU law, and again, as a matter of ECHR law, in fact, uh, this test is irrelevant. Uh, we, we don't really, uh, if I can be so blunt, uh, we don't really care about uh, the name of it. Uh, and it, there is not even a need uh, for uh, a legal, uh, a legislative uh, implementation of this, because Polish judges are directly empowered uh, by EU law to actually make sure that all rule of law requirements under EU law are applicable and applied in Poland. And one of these requirements is that uh, anyone, any litigant, is entitled. This is a fundamental right under EU law. Is entitled to an independent court established by law. So we're talking here about essentially the established by law requirements. So to call it test of independence is already kind of uh, confusing because in fact, uh, it should be called, if anything, established by law test. But to simplify uh, matters, essentially, it means, and the court confirmed that uh, yesterday, it means that every judge, every court in Poland is entitled to review the legality, for instance, of uh, judicial appointments especially when it comes to appointments made by the constitutional body known as the, or informally known as the Neo National Council of Judiciary in Poland, so KRS. And this is very interesting in the judgment. I think not everyone uh, has seen this, uh, but uh, the Court of Justice essentially told us uh, yesterday that the Neo KRS is not independent. That has been established already uh, in Polish law by the lawful judges of the Supreme Court. And every Polish judge, the court said, is entitled to conclude that the neo KRS is not independent. And from this uh, first conclusion, then they can draw additional conclusions regarding anyone appointed uh, post-2018 uh, by this body pretending to be the National Council of Judiciary. Uh, it is my understanding that uh, there has been already finding that this body is not uh, compatible or is not the same as the one laid down in the Polish constitution as a matter of Polish constitutional law. Uh, but uh, to simplify and summarize, essentially, the Court of Justice has confirmed uh, the obvious. You cannot punish or even subject a Polish judge for applying EU rule of law requirements, one of which allows, in fact, uh, compels, it's not even uh, an option, it's an obligation uh, for uh, judges, especially appeal judges, uh, to review the legality of the composition, especially of first instance courts. Uh, what has already been established, not by the Court of Justice, but by, by the European Court of Human Rights, is that every single uh, nomination made by the neo KRS is irregular as a matter of principle. So that's already established. 
Uh, the Court of Justice has not been able to say the same, but just because he hasn't been asked the, the direct question by the Commission in an infringement action. But the Court of Justice yesterday stated that it's already established by the Polish Supreme Court, the lawful judges of the Polish Supreme Court, that the Neo-KRS is not independent. And it is for the Polish judges to uh, uh, draw necessary conclusions when reviewing uh, Neo-KRS appointments. You cannot punish or even subject the Polish judge for disciplinary proceedings on the basis that the Polish judge is simply applying EU law and what is called in EU law, effective judicial protection, which includes the so-called established by law requirement, meaning that everyone is entitled to be, to have UKs adjudicated by legally, lawfully appointed judges. I mean, this is very basic. I mean, uh, Everyone uh, would like, uh, I suppose, I mean, everyone uh, would assume that uh, if you bring a case to a court, that you bring a case to a proper court with uh, judges have been lawfully appointed. Otherwise, this is total anarchy, and this is essentially uh, the legalization of lawlessness. Obviously, there is a very easy way out, uh, uh, at least legally speaking, for Polish authorities accept that they made a mess with the KRS uh, and essentially accept that every appointment made uh, post-2018 to the Supreme Court is not valid, that these individuals uh, were never to begin with Supreme Court judges, so they cannot lawfully adjudicate. They should be removed immediately from adjudication duties. Regarding appointments to the ordinary courts, every single one of these appointments must be reviewed. Uh, with uh, the irregularly appointed judges, uh, uh, they have to, sub to be subject to a, a new appointment process. Uh, it's all explained actually in uh, uh, an article, uh, st seven study I published uh, with uh, a Polish lawyer, uh, Jacob, um, in January. But essentially, if Polish authorities keep punishing Polish judges, lawfully appointed ones, for applying this uh, independent test, uh, whatever you want to call it, uh, essentially the review of the legality of the appointments post-2018. This is going simply to exacerbate the current mess, and we're going to end up with hundreds and hundreds of judgments against Poland in the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, that's the easiest uh, route uh, for litigants. As of today, perhaps this is not fully understood, Every single litigant in Poland whose judgment has been issued by someone appointed post-2018 uh, can reasonably expect to win a lawsuit in Strasbourg on the basis that uh, his case was decided by an irregularly composed uh, courts. As of today, I think we have more than 300 um, 50 communicated complaints in Strasbourg, uh, only 10 applications have been decided. Among these 350 applications, uh, we have uh, quite a few uh, on this very specific problem. The court, of, the court of in Strasbourg, not the Court of Justice, but European Court of Human Rights, will soon clarify whether the involvement of at any, um, at any stage in judicial proceedings of anyone appointed uh, by the Neo-KRS automatically amounts to a violation of Article 6, Paragraph 1 of the ECHR, that is, the right to a fair trial. I expect the court to conclude as such. Uh, you can draw this conclusion already from the case law, but it's not as explicitly stated yet. Uh, what is crystal clear is that every judgment issued by the Supreme Court in a formation which includes anyone appointed post-2018 by the Polish president on the basis of the nomination from the unconstitutional body known as the Neo-KRS, that's automatically a win in Strasbourg. This is also bad news for Polish taxpayers because uh, every time you lose in Strasbourg, uh, financial compensation is going to be awarded. Now, the Polish authorities have started not paying financial compensation, but that's... Uh, just the late one of the latest elements in the organized lawlessness uh, they have been they have been pursuing, but this is and I suppose we can discuss this in the next round. This means that you can expect Polish taxpayers to end up uh, having to pay um, uh, bigger and bigger amounts of uh, uh, money because the violations keep piling up. And uh, we can just, uh, we, we all know that uh, recovery money has been suspended, but that's not the only part of money which has been suspended. 
and Polish taxpayers have already uh, lost, uh, uh, thanks to the action of their uh, of Polish authorities, more than 550 million uh, euros due to non-compliance with the order of the Court of Justice in the Merzel law. So these 550 millions are gone. That's that's over. That's uh, that's it. Uh, Polish taxpayers are suffering the financial cost of the government's uh, deliberate uh, violations and repeated violations of basic requirements of EU law, which has which have always been part of EU law, because we're talking about the fundamental rights uh, to a fair trial, which does obviously automatically imply access to an independent court with judges lawfully appointed. So the pain is going to grow if this non-compliance doesn't stop. Thank you, Laurent. Yes, indeed, the Polish citizens maybe finally will uh, feel and that the pockets are emptier and emptier. And Monika, but what are uh, specifically the outcomes, the consequences of this judgment for Polish judges? So for, for this part of Polish citizens and what do you expect uh, from the Polish authorities to finally do? Well, unfortunately, as I said earlier, as uh, and what Jacek Jelichodziejewski wrote, for example, <laughs> I do not expect uh, any positive response from Polish authorities at the moment. Uh, what they might do is uh, could be another smoke screen, like they always used to do. It's what Patrick uh, already said. Uh, so, uh, and we already uh, heard uh, the Minister of Justice and some authorities and members of our government. So we know <laughs> that the reaction is, is, is very negative. Uh, for Polish judges, it's maybe, it, it, of course, it's, 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 it's super important and it uh, gives confidence uh, for Polish judges to uh, continue uh, uh, to implementing European law. Uh, it also, I think it, it what Patrick, what Lohan said, uh, sooner or later, um, authorities, people who uh, break law uh, are going to pay for this. And uh, for sure, there will be some uh, criminal proceedings. And this is another argument uh, in the future for, for uh, in this, in this proceedings, I think. Uh, I think that uh, in some particular disciplinary proceedings, which are already pending, disciplinary courts might be uh, more confident to, um, uh, to adjudicate now and uh, acquit judges or just drop the case, the cases against some, some judges. Uh, but as I said, I really don't think that something uh, is going to happen with Polish law and we need the change on the political scene uh, to restore the rule of law in, in Poland. And what Laurel said already about these hundreds of cases in tribunal in Strasbourg, unfortunately, even if we managed to restore rule of law in Poland. Polish citizens, we have to pay for years compensations because of what has happened in the last uh, seven years. So uh, it's uh, uh, it's negative prognostic, but of course the you cannot really undermine the the importance of this uh, it, of this verdict and it is super also important for uh, restoring rule of law uh, in Poland and for some directions um, uh, in amending and and uh, constructing new law which already is there are some uh, some drafts <laughs> already so we can use it in the future yes so fortunately uh, justitia associations for polish judges has been preparing a draft bill that will finally 
uh, amend the situation in the National Council of Judiciary and in Common Courts. And as far as I know, it will be presented uh, at the end of uh, this month during a Congress of Polish Lawyers in Gdańsk, so June 24th. Uh, I'm sure uh, you will be very attuned and we'll be reporting on that. Um, so next question is to Patrick uh, to give the last word to Laurent before our um, small exercise. We'll have a small exercise, like an opinion poll. Uh, Patrick, um, so actually what actions can civil society undertake at the moment? Uh, well, this is a very difficult question because no, civil society organizations act on a different fields, let's let's call it in this way. Speaking about uh, draft legislation to restore the rule of law uh, that Monica and Laurent have, have already mentioned, uh, I can see that many participants are not from Poland, so let me give a short background what is about what is happening. Uh, you know, living in a country that is run by authoritarian populist government, you must take into account as a civil society organization not to disclose your, you know, best proposals uh, because you, there is the, the government, the ruling majority may immediately respond and, you know, block any uh, any legal legal way that you have found to, you, to restore the situation. So many, many uh initiatives are taking place uh, not publicly some of them have been published already by judges from justicia by patori foundation the, the proposal about the constitutional tribunal uh, some uh, studies have been have been made also by helsinki foundation for human rights about the about the limits of of restoring the rule of law that it must you know be uh, in compliance with human rights, those uh, neo judges must have legal remedy and so forth and, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, so these are two two main uh, ways that these proposals are being prepared. Uh, but what is also important to mention is that uh, there is a split between civil society organization as to the approach towards uh, the restoration of the rule of law. Some organizations, sorry for my words, are sometimes seen as, as much more radical. They want to, you know, uh, go to the status quo ante immediately and get rid of, of those neo judges and so on and so forth. Some care more about, you know, procedural rights, think about much more sophisticated proposals, how to deal with this, with the, with this topic. This is a very, you know, I am not complaining. This is a very good situation because we have at least a debate about the approach. Uh, and we are in both groups are taking into account, you know, building up the, the case law that is building up from both Strasbourg and, and Luxembourg, and the judgment from yesterday is, is is another step, you know, to improve the the the, the proposals of, of of both groups at the very low level. So, or, or economically speaking, in, in short in short term, what is what uh, should the civil society uh, society organization role be? I think. Uh, uh, well, it is important to remind judges that what uh, Professor Pech has said, that each of them is individually em empowered according to EU law uh, with, with the obligation to verify the status of other judge. So if an organization conducts strategic litigations, uh, joins as a party to the proceedings, uh, this organization I think it is a duty of a civil society organization to remind the judge that about his or her obligations under EU law. Uh, so these are these are the most um, uh, important issues. And the third one is also what we are doing today is to explain to the society about the importance of the case law of each particular judgment and to uh, you know and to respond to uh, government arguments, the false arguments about about the uh, 
the attack of the European Union on, on the Polish constitution and so on and so forth and and the judiciocracy something like that that uh, uh, Ministry of Justice Jobro is is con is constantly saying about so I think this is a, a very important role of the of the civil society or organizations in many fields uh, but the most important is I think that the first one so the proposals to restore the rule of law uh, but we also have to we also need to take into account what was said in the judgment of the Strasbourg court in Astrazon that the restoration of the rule of law has its limits that you know the passage of time the acceptance of the society about the current state of affairs matters for the restoration of the rule of law uh i don't want to introduce you know political topics in our uh, in our conversation but uh it may be uh the, the 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 upcoming elections that will take place in october this year may have a very important impact on whether poland will be able to restore the situation to go back to the you know family of of eu member states that share the common values or whether we will go, uh, we will deepen or worsen the, 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 the current situation. So this is a, a very important issue. I don't want you to comment about this because this is, you know, this is politics and uh, and, and not uh, not a strictly strictly legal task. But in res uh, as uh, as far as the restoration of the rule of law is, is concerned, politics also matters. So this is my this is my message for today. Thank you. Thank you. And politics clearly matters in Brussels. And my next question, final question for Laurent, for me at least, uh, would be uh, about your expectations uh, for what the EU institutions uh, will do, should do after this judgment, especially in the case that there is little compliance from the Polish authorities. Thank you, Anna. Uh, just a quick, before I answer, just a, a quick reaction again uh, to Patrick's uh, comments. Um, in the study I previously mentioned, essentially, uh, we offered with Jacob uh, uh, a ready to be used kind of a set of guiding principles to restore the rule of law. Uh, it's easier to destroy the rule of law than to restore it. Uh, however, I would say I have never seen a country in the EU, at least, which has dismantled the rule of law in such intense, systemic, sustained manner. So I believe... Uh, existing case law does not account for the systemic nature and deliberate nature of the violations of EU law, which means the restoration of the rule of law would have to use uh, more radical means, which have been uh, then used elsewhere, because there is no point of reference in uh, since post-World War II, uh, when it comes to the destruction of the rule of law we have witnessed in the case of Poland. And in the case of Poland, it's quite radically different from uh, uh, for instance, the, the facts of the Icelandic judgment, because criminal acts were committed repeatedly. And on top of that, you had seen repeated violations of the police constitution. And in fact, a rather unprecedented aspect of the case law of Strasbourg, from my, as far as I know, it's the only time the Court of uh, the Court of Human Rights has found an acting head of state to have acted repeatedly in defiance of the rule of law. So the state liability of the current president of Poland, I would say, could be essentially uh, quite realistically entertained uh, in the next few years. There is a, a factual uh, evidence uh, base already available uh, as a matter of European law. So that's why I would say... Um, restore the rule of law in Poland would require some original innovative thinking, but also I would say some uh, sanctions which have never been applied anywhere else because we have never seen the extent of this destruction of the rule of law anywhere else, at least uh, I'm talking uh, post-World War II. Uh, sorry for this uh, long comment, um, but I think it's important um, uh, to mention that the, the unique, uh, sadly, uh, features of uh, Poland's uh, rule of law uh, breakdown. Um, regarding EU, uh, Anna, I can tell you what the EU should do, or I can tell you what the EU will do, but I don't think I can do both in uh, five minutes. Um, I, or perhaps I can try what the EU should do. Um, 
uh, more infringement actions uh, should get on with the uh, infringement actions against the constitutional tribunal and should get on uh, with the infringement action regarding the neo -Kairis. This is uh, really the stepping stone on which uh, the autocratization of the legal system in Poland is built. Every day where nothing is done regarding the neo -Kairis is a day where the rule of law is irreparably uh, damaged. So we need to do something. We need to stop uh, these unlawful appointments and nominations and appointments. Um, in addition, uh, obviously, infringement actions can be slow, especially if the commission does act in a too little, too late fashion. So it's very crucial uh, that the commission also applies for financial sanctions, not only regarding the previous judgment of the Court of Justice, but gets ready to apply for financial sanctions regarding the yesterday's judgment. Quite clear that the judgment won't be complied with. So I'm talking about uh, sanctions from the Court of Justice. On top of this, the Commission should not release a single euro uh, from uh, recovery funding and cohesion funding. Uh, if anything, uh, non-compliance with yesterday's ruling is only going to make the situation more difficult for the Commission to justify any release of any funding uh, from the EU. Uh, so, uh, and on top of this, I would like uh, the Council uh, to do its job and adopt uh, Article 7 recommendations and, uh, and impose a strict deadline. Uh, obviously, that might not be politically realistic, but it doesn't matter. Uh, uh, we can still uh, call upon the Council to do its job as per the treaties. I would also like to see uh, more bilateral reactions from other EU member states. Um, now, what might happen, however, is that we might not see any infringement actions because uh, it would seem that according to the current leadership of the Commission, at least, uh, infringement actions are not effective, which is not true, by the way. Uh, it's another case of the workmen uh, blaming its tools for a job uh, poorly done. So the key fight is going to be the release of EU funding. And uh, as you may know, but I, I can explain that to participants, uh, uh, last, uh, uh, last year, the Commission and the Council were ready to essentially appease uh, Polish authorities because of geopolitical reasons. So they were in a position, they were very willing to release EU funding to uh, Poland, assuming that Poland would only comply with uh, one judgment of the Court of Justice even though Poland is currently violating dozens and dozens of European rulings and domestic rulings. So the Commission was actually failing in its duty to ask for compliance with the entirety of the court's case law, which is why a European Association of Judges, for the very first time in the history of EU law, including the organization Monica belongs to, uh, MEDEL, they launched a set of annulment actions against the Council and the Commission regarding Poland's recovery plan. So uh, actions are pending. Uh, but um, this is, I would say, regardless of the outcome, uh, it was a necessary step to remind European institutions that uh, uh, the rulings, uh, rule of law rulings of the Court of Justice are not uh, bargaining chips. You cannot uh, ask uh, for compliance with the rule of law a la carte uh, based on your short-term political priorities. The rule of law should not be used as a kind of a political consideration or a viable of adjustment. Um, so essentially, we need to keep uh, pressurize uh, the Commission and the Council into actually fulfilling their duties under the EU treaties. So just to summarize, the key uh, legal fight, I suppose, is going to be uh, to make sure that the Commission and the Council do not sign off on releasing EU money on the back of cosmetic Potemkin-style uh, changes. Uh, the fact that the court's judgment yesterday is going to add to the headaches of the Commission and the Council is going to make their lives much more difficult uh, if they even had the intention of releasing uh, EU funding not only because the Polish government seems keen and not to cooperate or at least pretend to be cooperating anymore. Uh, and uh, the, if the commission and the council do not comply or do not seek to enforce uh, the judgment regarding the Muzzle law, uh, then uh, we will do our best to make their lives as uncomfortable as possible. Not because we have the time to do so, but because it's our duty as legal professionals just to make sure that uh, EU institutions fulfill their rule of law duties. So to be continued, but I hope essentially that we won't have to act again and that the Commission and the Council will do 
the right thing, which is simply to ask full immediate compliance with every single judgment and order of the Court of Justice. And I would add to this that the EU should also make sure that Polish authorities stop violating every single entry measure of the European Court of Human Rights and start complying with uh, the judgments of the European Court of Human Rights as well. And they should not uh, release any EU money until all the uh, bogus uh, judgments of this uh, kangaroo court known as the uh, Neo-Constitutional Tribunal are essentially politically nullified. So I would say I would personally not release a single euro until I get a political declaration from the government that they do not recognize as valid and lawfully composed the current constitutional tribunal and that they consider uh, no, um, essentially, and that they consider invalid the previous poll exit uh, rulings of the so-called uh, neo-constitutional tribunal. If they don't do that, I suppose, uh, then uh, the mess is only going to get messier and the ones which are going to pay the price are Polish litigants and Polish taxpayers. Uh, but I suppose that's why it's important for people to wake up and exercise the right to vote before they are deprived of free and fair elections. Thank you. Thank you, Laurent. Now we'll have some waking up exercise because we'll have a poll with a question to you. Um, the question will be, if you think that the Polish government will comply with the judgment of the Court of Justice of the European Union, you can choose one of the answers. That was quick. Mm -hmm. I think half of we have like um, the turnout of around 50%, uh, 17 people answered. Um, well, so the, the current outcome is that uh, no one thinks that um, the Polish government will comply. 35% uh, thinks that it won't comply and 65% think that there will be a fake compliance. Let's see, I'm taking a screenshot of this uh, result and uh, maybe we'll return in a year and see what happened. Um, and now it's a moment for um, Q&A. So we already have uh, questions from uh, two participants. If anyone would like to uh, include um, their question, please uh, write it down in the comment section. Uh, the first uh, question, uh, maybe I'll start by Judge uh, Lydia Heveling van Beck. Um, that's a question perhaps to Professor Pesch. How will this judgment relate to the case of the four international organizations of judges aiming at annihilating the decision of the EU Council regarding the formulated milestones by the EU Commission? Uh, very good question. Uh, uh, the short answer is not directly, uh, because the court is careful in a judgment yesterday to uh, uh, make clear that the court uh, ruled on the situation as it existed at the end of the infringement administrative phase. So the Court of Justice does not deal with the uh, Polish uh, changes adopted uh, in June 2022, for instance. So the court is about the judgment is about the measure law, not what happened afterwards in terms of the milestones, blah, blah, blah. But it's going to be indirectly relevant to the extent that is going to strengthen, in fact, the, the judge's application to the extent that the commission failed to include uh, in its uh, recovery uh, rule of law milestones. Um, the removal of every single aspect of the measure law, which is completely irresponsible, if you ask me. Uh, but this is going to make um, life more difficult for the lawyers representing the commission and the council, because one of the arguments raised by the judges is you are simply missing 80% uh, of the systemic violations of the rule of law, and you are ready to release EU funding on the basis of just compliance with a single judgment. It's completely absurd, completely Kafkaesque that they would do so. So I would say uh, yesterday's judgment is bad news for uh, the legal uh, uh, representatives who are going to try to argue the substance of the case before the EU General Court. We are expecting uh, a hearing uh, actually uh, at some point, perhaps uh, in July, or if not uh, in September, 
all of the cases are pending. Um, um, we will we shall see the outcome because um, you know, we might not get to the substance. Uh, the, the all of the application raise very important constitutional issues, especially when it comes to legal standing of uh, judicial associations. Uh, but what I can tell you, I mean, what not cannot tell you as a matter of fact, but I would say that if I were one of the lawyers defending the commission in the council in these cases, I would not feel comfortable. Uh, so let me just put it that way, because it's quite clear, I would say, from the substance uh, that the Association of Judges are not 99% uh, right. I would say they are 100% uh, legally right. So the only hope, really, for the Commission and the Council, I would say, is for the Association of Judges not to be given or recognized as having legal standing. But we shall see. Regardless, uh, it was good to see a European Association of Judges taking a stand, and yesterday's judgment is only uh, going to indirectly uh, strengthen uh, their applications, I would say. Thank you. We have a question from Victoria Alžbieta Sutorisova. Um, in Slovakia, judges have to submit an asset declaration yearly, which, sorry, because someone asked, which is then made public. Could this be infringing the EU law and the right uh, for privacy of judges to maybe that's a question to Monica, and I don't want to you know push you, but yeah, well, it's difficult to answer because we don't know the details and we don't know the dimension of the uh, the, the the statement that Slovakian judges need to make. Uh, well, in in Poland, we. We used to have this obligation even before 2015, but it wasn't public. It was just a statement what we had to deliver to the president of the Court of Appeal. And uh, then to uh, to the office, to the tax office. And it happened twice that they asked me uh, to explain some uh, money I had on my account and I had to explain that I it's simply because I'm married <laughs> it was my husband's money actually uh, so it, it, it depends uh, um, as far as I know uh, there, there hasn't been such case uh, at least in European Court for Human Rights. Uh, in case of Bulgaria, there was also the case concerning uh, uh, the obligation to, um, to declare uh, whether a judge is a member of foundation or something. And, and there was also the, already the verdict delivered saying that it's uh, infringing the European standards. But in case of assets, uh, I don't know. I don't, I don't think that you, you can in general say that it's contrary to European law. It, it all depends. And of course, you cannot reveal the data about what the address of your property and so on. Uh, it, also, um, it, it has to be covered, but, uh, but the general idea, I think you can say uh, that uh, it might be important for people to know uh, whether uh, you, for some reasons, became much more richer in one particular year. And so that's what I can say. Patrick, you raised your hand. Maybe you have a comment. Yeah, just a couple of uh, couple of sentences. Uh, well, uh, in the judgment delivered yesterday, the Court of Justice said that it is a legitimate interest of the whole European Union uh, to uh, enhance judicial independence, and the measure uh, such as the requirement to disclose some personal information is, you know, within this 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 general interest uh, what uh, what was important in the, in the judgment was that the the ruling majority deliberately uh, did um, uh, did this requirement in uh, in proportionate uh, in comparison to this legitimate interest so across europe there are uh, th there is a variety of 
of uh, requirements on judges to declare assets, some um, connections with members of the government and so on and, and so forth. And normally this is fine from the point of view of judicial independence and protection of privacy and, and personal data. What is important is, the, the, is, is to strike a right balance between on the one hand the privacy, the respect for private life of judges, and the importance to safeguard the judicial uh, independence and also the the appearance of, of independence from the point of view of the of the society polish muzzle law failed this test but i can uh, i can think about many uh, legal systems that are completely fine with 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 eu law uh, and as monica said uh, the uh, the situation in which judge becomes significantly richer in what in one year, uh, in comparison to previous to previous year, uh, this is a red flag. I think to in 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 every European jurisdiction. Uh, so this is a this is a good tool that this must be used. You know, with with a with a great responsibility from the point of view of of the government. Mm. Um. Okay, the next question uh, would be from Alexei Dimitrov, and uh, I'm sorry, but it must be the last question because we are running uh, out of time. So, uh, should there be some training for the Commission on Handling Infringement Cases? For example, a great opportunity to do to contest the composition of the extraordinary chamber was missed due to the late submission of this argument in the case about the muzzle law. Oh, Professor Pesh is smiling. Um, <laughs> yes, I'm smiling because the question is nicely uh, passive aggressive. So well done, Alex. Um, uh, they don't need any training. Um, what they do need, uh, perhaps, is to grow a spine and uh, be uh, more proactive. Uh, in this case, I cannot. I'm not sure what happened. I don't have any insider information, but I'm assuming that uh, it was uh, raised late because they were. It wasn't raised until after the judgment of the European Court of Human Rights made this clear. Uh, instead of uh, they should have raised it from the initial start of the infringement action because it was already uh, in the Article 7 reason proposal of December 2017. There was no need to wait uh, for a late uh, 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 submission on this uh, on this front. It was always clear that the extraordinary chamber is as bogus as the disciplinary chamber. Every single member of the extraordinary chamber is not a lawful judge. This is a joke of a body. Uh, it is obviously in violation of ECHR law, but a violation of Polish constitutional law and EU law. Uh, so I uh, just a biggest belief that he wasn't raised uh, from the start, but possibly just because uh, this they just woke up uh, after uh, seeing the judgment of the European Court of Human Rights. Generally speaking, actually, this does raise an important question. Should the Commission wait for uh, judgments of the Strasbourg Court and the preliminary rulings to build infringement cases, or should I rather lead rather than follow? Sadly, my understanding, or at least my analysis of uh, rule of law infringement policies, that the Commission has always acted in a too little, too late fashion because they are acting in a reactive way. They are waiting for findings to emerge from preliminary rulings and from the case law of the Strasbourg Court. But that's not the way the EU treaties were designed. The Commission, as guardian of the treaty, is not supposed to wait for national judges to refer questions and then subject themselves to disciplinary proceedings and sanctions. This is completely irresponsible. This is an abdication of their duties. I'm sorry for using strong language, uh, but uh, I find this uh, quite frustrating. It has been more than, let's say, since 2000, the end of 2015 that we've been talking about Poland's rule of law crisis. How many infringement judgments have we got since the end of 2015? A total of five launched, so less than one per year, and a total of four judgments. So again, one uh, less than one judgment per year. This is not uh, good enough. Time is on the size of those destroying the rule of law. The Commission as a guardian of the tree must be proactive. Same story regarding the neo Why is Where is the infringement action? Uh, the infringement action regarding the composition of the extraordinary chamber should have been filed in 2018. Uh, we are in 2023, and then we're talking about 3,000 individuals 
acting as judges in Poland, even though they have been irregularly appointed via an unconstitutional body. The damage to the rule of law we see in Poland is sadly, I'm afraid to say, indirectly due to the passivity and procrastination uh, of too many uh, key actors in Brussels. Uh, it is actually uh, to the shame of the EU that the European Court of Human Rights has done uh, more, uh, has had more impact and has issued uh, more uh, judgments than the Court of Justice on the basis of infringement actions. I'm not blaming the Court of Justice here, because the Court of Justice cannot, uh, you know, uh, invent case, uh, bring cases uh, by itself. He, he has to receive applications from the Commission, and the Commission, I'm afraid, is not uh, doing uh, a, enough of a good job. So sorry for the long annoyed answer to your question, Alex, uh, but just to make clear, Alex, I'm not annoyed uh, with you. I'm annoyed with the fact that the extraordinary chamber uh, was not the composition of it or unlawful composition of it was raised too late, forcing the Court of Justice uh, not to tackle this uh, uh, this uh, plea, which is a shame. That's another missed opportunity. Uh, but anyway, we know as a matter of ECHR law, uh, and since uh, that it's not a court, and since uh, uh, as per the EU Charter, ECHR case law uh, constitutes uh, minimal uh, standards uh, in EU law, and then it's a given that the extraordinary chamber is not a court either under EU law. So any decision adopted by the extraordinary chamber uh, then can be challenged in Strasbourg, and that's automatically a win uh, for uh, the relevant uh, party and automatically a loss for Polish taxpayers, as I've mentioned before. Thank you very much. I need to use my power to uh, say that, unfortunately, this is the end of our today's meeting, but the meeting will be recorded, so that stays for posterity. And I hope that we will um, meet very uh, regularly on Twitter. I encourage you to follow ruleoflaw.pl uh, website, and I'll also uh, we will have uh, more debates uh, around certain reports uh, that the Viktor Osetinsky Archive and OCO Press will publish in Polish and English. So please follow our activities. And uh, my heartfelt thanks to all of the panelists. It was a pleasure, as always, to hear what you have to say. <laughs>